Money Show. Personal Finance with Warren Ingram. 24 minutes to 8 o'clock and good evening to Warren Ingram talking about how is the best way to fight inflation. Good to chat you once again. Warren, are you with us? Warren Ingram? Hi. hi sorry, sorry about that. A little technical glitch, but great to be on the show with you. Good to be unmuted. Thank you, Warren Ingram. Good to have you with us as well. <laughs> no problem. Okay, fighting inflation, fighting inflation. How do we do it personally? Because we feel so helpless in this day and age where you hear what the Reserve Bank has to say, those CPI figures come out from Stats SA and it's 7% inflation. Then we go to the supermarket and we can't afford anything because everything's gone up. How can we fight inflation? Uh, I think for, firstly, just a very quick, uh, and for my own sake, a very simple maths lesson. So uh, let's assume someone earns 100,000 Rand a year, and they set, they spend 50,000 Rand of, of that every year um, on, on running their life. So for, for the person spending 50,000 Rand a year, if if we get um, a, a big jump in inflation and our cost of living or CPI goes up by 10%, that means that the person who's spending 50,000 Rand a year, that they now need to find a way to get an extra 5,000 Rand because, you know, 10% of, of 50,000 is, is 5,000. So, so they need to find a way to get to, to 55,000 to, to, just to maintain their standard of living. And, and why, why I'm giving you the math lesson is because uh, if you spend a little bit less than you earn, then w when there is this big uh, jump in inflation, negotiating a, a salary increase, which we always hear about, you know, with, with unions, like we can see it now with, with the, the gold miners, um, you, you know, f fighting with the, the, the gold workers and, and, and the unions and the like. It's important to understand that people, uh, you know, negotiating for a higher salary, if, if they're spending less than they're earning and they just want to maintain their standard of living in a, in a lousy year where, where everything's not going well, then actually what you're focusing on is your expenses and not your salary because you know a, a 10% jump in your salary to match CPI means that you know if you're earning 100,000 you you're arguing for mm. a 10,000 rand raise uh, whereas your cost of living has gone from 50,000 to 55,000 so so the first way and the first hint in in, in this whole long introduction and so, sorry for that is make sure that you spend a bit less than you earn because there are going to be years when employers are going to struggle to, to jump your salary in line with inflation, especially yeah. if we suddenly see a big spike in inflation and, and companies weren't ready for it and they weren't prepared uh, for, for that in their budgets. So, see, so spending less yeah. than you earn is a great call. I mean, I think just to understand that, that you know, that, that gives you a bit of a, a bit of a gap. Unfortunately, for, for people who are spending everything that they earn and, and maybe even more than they're earning uh, every month, then they really need to fight hard to to get at least that inflation increase, just so that they can they can stand still. You know that their, their standard of living doesn't go down. So, the, for, for me, that that's an important thing to understand for your own personal uh, financial maths. Every, you know, every time this this situation arises, is what do I absolutely absolutely need to push for just to make sure that I that I'm standing still? Obviously, you know, none of us want to stand still in life, but there might be years where things aren't going well for the economy, for your company, whatever it is, uh, and you just need to make sure that you're not going backwards. And, and then that, that maths lesson m m might stand you in, in good stead. Yeah. For, for, for most people in South Africa, it's, 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 it's maybe kind of an eye-opening you know, experience to understand that you know, when, when low-income workers are affected by inflation, that it, you know, we, we hear it, you know, we have people saying, yeah, the poor are infected uh, by, by inflation more than, than, than high income earners. And, and, you know, often, uh, I suppose, high income earners just dismiss that as, you know, as, as kind of cheap politics or, you know, cheap tactics by, by unions. But actually, this is exactly the reason why. It's because for, for, for low income earners, they, they, they need every single cent uh, just to get by and just to maintain a, a standard of living. Yeah, it's it's so, so difficult, uh, Warren. So sorry, it's, it's just so very difficult because you're right. We, if we are lucky enough to get a salary increase at three or four percent, if we're lucky enough, but if you're sitting with inflation at seven percent, and also is that real inflation? Is that really how things have gone up? Because very often you'll look at petrol that's shot up by more than just seven percent. I mean, how do you even cope with that? 
Uh, I mean, that's a, a, a fantastic point, Ray, because I think uh, the people, um, you know, they get frustrated when they hear these official uh, inflation numbers being quoted and they go, well, you know, that's definitely not my inflation. No, the, the, you know, the, uh, whoever calculates the stuff is either smoking something or they're lying or they're manipulating the numbers and, you know, we're, we're being, we're, you know, have the wool pulled over our eyes. And I think it's just important to understand that that, that the measure of, of CPI, the measure of inflation, is is to try and, and, and get to sort of an average basket of goods and services that, that people are using in the country over an average period of time. So, so it's not to say that it's going to be a, a very accurate measure for, for everyone in our country. In fact, uh, you, you know, actually, you can break CPI down or you know, inflation down to various income levels, and you'll see that you know, actually, if you do, if you do it to an income level, you'll see that CPI is different for for, for different le- le- levels of income. So when we're in a situation where, uh, you, you know, let's say for a high income earner, and um, and and they find and we find that the rand's you know weakening dramatically and it's affecting the, the price of imported goods. Then, uh, then, then you might find, you know, high income earners tend to spend more on, on, on imported stuff than, than low income earners who, who are spending most of their money on fuel and, and food. So, so you're right. I mean, I think that, you know, we must be careful not mm-hmm. to get sucked into this thing that, you know, our, our personal cost of living is, and, and the, and the way that that's increasing or not is, is measured by CPI. It's certainly not. Yeah. So. So I think, uh, you know, for me, the, the, the key message for, for someone in a situation like this is the, 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 the one thing to do is, is try and when you, do, when you are in a, in a, in a space where you can kind of control your, your, your expenses to some extent, then in a time like this, it's, it's to know that, you know, if you're, if you're arguing for a salary raise, that's great and, and, and try and get one, but, but you might need to change the mix of your, your, your expenses. You might need to try and find a gap when we're in this high inflation space, because it, it might be a bump that comes and, and hits you for a period of time and then, and then normalizes again. But to fight it, to, 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 to give you a very long answer, I, yeah. I still haven't got there yet, but, but, but <laughs> to, to fight inflation, I, I feel uh, the, the, the one thing we need to do is we need to start allocating some of our monthly on a month, m- monthly, our money on a monthly basis to investments that have the ability to beat inflation. Because there might be times when we can use income from our investments to 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 help us when our salaries aren't aren't matching inflation, and and there, there are t- two main kinds of in investment asset types that 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 have a good history of of beating inflation over long periods of time. Yeah, surprise, surprise. The one is the stock market, and and then the <laughs> other will will in general be the the broader property market. So I I, I don't want to get the state agents excited. I'm, I'm not necessarily talking about. Uh, re- residential houses. I'm talking about the whole property market. You know, you know in other words, sure. property companies and 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 you know, the, especially things that that own these kind of big logistics hubs and and office buildings and retail hubs, uh, and, and maybe you know, in in some instances as well, residential property. But but those are you know, when you look at shares or you or you look at uh, uh, property, they, they have a fairly good history of. At least ensuring that the, the income that they generate rises with with inflation, so it will tend to match the inflation rate, and often they'll have additional capital growth, which then gives you that inflation protection. And, and for me, Ray, those are those are two kind of key points when we're looking at this high inflation space. Is to say we need to find things that are going to grow faster than inflation, so that if our income is not growing faster, at least we're still you know matching or beating inflation with the growth of our assets, and hopefully that can subsidize. So some of the, the income shortfalls that we might have over a year or two. And, and, then, and then secondly, we've got to find ways, and I know it's hard, I, I, know, I know people uh, you know, always say that, is it's difficult to find a gap in a way to save on a monthly basis. But, but as you can see from my simple math lesson, you yeah. know, you know, if you do spend a bit less than you earn, th- then all of a sudden you've got automatic inflation protection built into, into your whole plan, and you, you know, you're not necessarily going to be as severely affected as, as other, others might mm. be. You're quite, yeah, it's quite clever, actually. All right, talking, fighting inflation with Warren Ingram tonight. Like your SMS is on 31702 or 31567. The Money Show. Personal Finance with Warren Ingram.
Right, talking to Warren tonight about inflation and fighting inflation. I've got a few questions for you as well, Warren, and this is the nice thing about getting you on the show at least once a week. There's a question here that says, Hi, Warren, I need some guidance regarding my offshore investments. I have some investments that mostly consist of ETFs that are domiciled in Guernsey. I don't have any financial dependence, but I would like to ensure that my parents receive this money if I die. How do I do that? That's from Jasmine. So actually a great question, Ray. And, and you know, the, the danger for anyone listening is if you ask Warren about tax advice, uh, you, you've got big problems because you know, he's an investment guy. <laughs> yeah. but, uh, but, but, but I think the, the, the one, I did some reading on this and, and it, it's, it's a really good, uh, a good, good thing to focus on because, you know, for, both in Guernsey, but many jurisdictions around the world, when, when you've got investments that are, that are housed in those countries. So for example, you know, you buy shares, you know, my, my favorite share in the world is Berkshire Hathaway. And that, you know, that's listed in the American Stock Exchange. Yeah, yeah. But, but if I've got a share listed in the American Stock Exchange, um, I, I need to be clear about, uh, about, you know, does my South African will actually sort that out if I die or will I end up with, you know, having died and, and, and in America being considered to have died without a will? And then a, a whole lot of American rules are going to apply. And, and the same in, in Guernsey. So there are some countries like Switzerland, I, I know for a fact that will, recognize the South African will uh, and, and, and South African letters of executorship, no problem. But, but places like Guernsey and, 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 and especially the UK, you know, in general, they're, they're a little bit more complicated because they, they might well recognize a, a South African will and, and the, the South African letters of executorship. Uh, but there, there is an entire process that, that follows that. So, so for, for, for someone in Jasmine's position, you know, I, I know it's a pain in, uh, in the backside to try and speak to lo- lots of lawyers and to try and get pr- proper advice on this. But, but my view is, uh, when you've got investments that, that are housed in a, in a foreign jurisdiction, uh, and, and especially if you end up with investments housed in two or three different jur- jurisdictions, w- which might be really easy if you've got a unit trust, uh, you, you know, overseas, which might be in Ireland, uh, you, know, you know, some ETFs in, in, in Guernsey and, you know, maybe a bank account in the UK, that then you definitely need to get yourself some proper legal advice. And, and often they'll, they'll say, you know, the, the, the lawyers will say, get a will that covers your, your South African assets and then make sure that your South African will speaks to an international will and that that will then covers your, your overseas assets and make sure that it's done correctly with, with, with the right lawyer. So I know, I know I'm sitting on the fence with this one a little bit, Ray, but I <laughs> yeah. think. You know, Jasmine's got a great question, but I think there are lots of people out there w- w- who might have assets all around the world and, and not just in, 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 in Guernsey. Uh, and, and this is something that, that, that often gets ignored, you know, and, and just simple ignorance uh, about multiple jurisdictions can really trip up a family later in life. So, so mm. I would say if you've got assets all over the place and they're not just in South Africa, speak to someone, you know, especially a, a, a international estate planning expert to find out exactly what you need to do. And yes, in some instances, you will actually need two or, or you know, uh, three wills if, if need be. Right. Answering questions tonight. We've been talking about fighting inflation in a personal capacity, making sure that we survive, making sure that we earn more than we spend, we get our costs down, and we have that buffer zone. zone rather. There's an SMS here. It says, gents, if I'm putting a lump sum into my RA now, what tips, aside from RAND cost averaging, can you give? Should I put it in a money markets fund and wait for markets to go down more or go into a balanced fund? That's from Mark. It's a really interesting question. Yeah, th- um, th- thanks, Mark, because you, you took away my f- what my first golden tip, which was, you know, you should <laughs> definitely phase the money into the market over yeah. a time. And now you've taken my, my one big tip out. But 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 I think I, I, I really don't like the idea of putting my money in cash, uh, in, you know, in the money market account and then waiting for things to get better. Because the, the logic of waiting for things to be- get better tells you uh, th- that by the time things are better, the likelihood is that, you know, stock markets have jumped, you know, bond markets have recovered, you know, everything's okay again. So, so w- what we tend to find is, you know, stock markets, bond markets, uh, you know, property markets, you, you know, even uh, tend to run a little bit ahead of the news. So, so by the time we all figure out that actually things are okay again, things are better, what we find is that the prices of those markets have already recovered very substantially. And, and so th- then investors tend to miss out on that recovery because they've been sitting in cash waiting for things to get better. And unfortunately, not on this show and not in any, you know, any place in the world do we, do we kind of hear the bell ringing to say, hey, 
it's now time to buy because things are better. <laughs> yeah. um, so, so we've got to be careful with that. I, I tend to want to buy a lot more and I want to be aggressive in buying assets when things are really not sounding good. You know, when everyone's got high levels of fear, high levels of uncertainty, because that's the time when, when the prices of these good assets are generally going to be much cheaper than they are when, when things are going really well. You know, you know, so it's easy to buy investments psychologically when, when, when things are pumping, you know, and, and everyone's feeling happy and optimistic and, you know, uh, profits are rising and economies are growing. It's, it's an easy time to be a buyer. But unfortunately, you're not necessarily buying well-priced assets at that point. You might actually be buying expensive assets. So, so the only way you yeah. buy cheap assets is when you get brave and, and you, you buy when everyone else is getting afraid. But, and, and I know we weren't allowed to use the averaging there, but I would, I wouldn't mind averaging a bit into those, uh, into those uh, well-priced assets, um, you know, and, and spread that decision out over a couple of months just because, you know, things might fall for a few months. They might not just fall immediately and recover immediately. Yeah. I actually wish I could go back in time to before COVID. And with the knowledge I have now, start investing. I would buy Sassel shares because you could have made a killing out of that. And perhaps you're right, Warren. Perhaps you do have to be more aggressive in times like this because if you are, you could make a killing. You could make a loss. But then you are investing in the long term anyway. So maybe just take a wait and see and then know when to jump out and when not to. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I suppose I'm, I'm, I know I sound so old school, but but I love uh, I love Warren Buffett's attitude to this stuff, which is you know assume that when you're going to buy an investment, you're buying it for the rest of your life, so you're not planning to sell it at any point unless things have gone horribly wrong. So you're buying something because you think it's going to be a great growth investment over over your lifetime, and and so you, you're going to apply your mind much more carefully to something where you where you're assuming you're never going to sell it, and and secondly. You're looking to buy that at the cheapest price possible because, because you want to get as much growth out of it as, as you can. So, so if you take the, the attitude of a patient investor where, where you're happy to be a buyer and you're really loath to be a seller, then I think you take these decisions just generally, all of us, we would take them much more seriously. Uh, and, and if you can generally just be a buyer when, 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 when the world's, you know, unstable and fearful, and, and never a seller in those environments, I think, you know, th- th- that would be a fabulous way to, to, to be a long-term uh, growth investor. Yeah. Final SMS here talking about your comments on property. What just says, can you please expand a little bit more on residential property? And I think that's a very interesting SMS because the rental market could probably thrive now if interest rates continue to go up because nobody can buy. That's that's true, Ray. I think it's a it's a valid point. I, I think the 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 issue with uh, re- residential property is that it's affected by interest rates, as um, you know, and and uh, as you point out. But but the other thing is it's it's really a big function of of how the economy is growing. So so when the South African economy is doing well, then you'll find that that just in general residential property will will go well. But when the economy is stagnant, and and I'm not saying. Um, Go, no, not growing at all, but but if it's growing at one or two percent a year, frankly, that's stagnant because you know the cost of living, as we've just discussed, is is rising much faster than that. So so you know when the economy is growing at three or four or five percent a year, that's really healthy for the rental property market and, and makes it a great place to to invest, uh, you know, and get a return on your money. But but when it's uh, w- when we're in a very low growth uh, e- economy and, and inflation is growing faster than the econ- economic growth. Actually, in real terms, we're going backwards, and and then it's not such a brilliant in, environment for residential property. And over decades, and and sometimes mm-hmm. over centuries, it's important to know that the residential market only grows at about half to one percent a year above inflation. Right. It's actually not a brilliant place for very big capital growth. There will be times when when the residential market does extremely well. The late 1990s was a case in point in South Africa, but for most. Most markets, South Africa included, re- residential property simply tracks inflation and slightly better. So, so I'm not a big fan. You know, I, I, I tend to prefer property companies in general because at least they, they, they can grow faster than inflation. They've got a very good history of doing that, but, but they come with massive volatility. And I'm conscious of, of, of talking about property companies after the big ones have, have lost sometimes 50% of their value you know, in, in the last couple of years. 
Yeah, it, it's, it certainly is something to think about. Warren Ingram, financial advisor at Galileo Capital. Thank you so much for chatting to us tonight. We definitely will start saving and spending less. Perhaps it's time to go back to our budgets and think to ourselves, do I really need that DSTV? Do I need something else? Warren, we'll speak to you again next week. Thank you so much.